And uh, our topic today is going to be human origins and world migrations and the myth of race. And I put a subtitle this time below. It says, uh, Our Genes Define Who We Are. And I think you'll get a little better perspective of that, at least I did, by uh, adding some of my laboratory research technology and knowledge uh, to what I've read in books on anthropology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we get started, this is the uh, race committee that uh, I work with. They're the ones that have been guiding this whole program, and uh, it's been quite exciting. As Sharon Hayes, uh, Linda Maddy, Karen Herman is the chair of the committee, uh, and Jacob Malwitz and Greta Cruz, who's here today organizing many of these talks, Thomas Welch, Susan Elquist, and myself. Uh, and th this slide shows that we're not collecting any money here. This is uh, free, so we have nothing to disclose. And by the way, Karen Herman, the chair, uh, is actually, it was her idea that I try to put together a lecture like this, so uh, we can blame her for all this. Uh, this is for our staff. Uh, don't forget to swipe your uh, cards for your CME. And uh, we want to thank Best Buy, the Children's Foundation of Best Buy, and the Mayo Clinic uh, Employees Credit Union for support, financial support for this whole program. <clears throat> now, this is a little outline that I put together uh, uh, kind of outlining what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk first a little bit about physical anthropology. Now, that's been around for hundreds of years where scientists and archaeologists, anthropologists have traveled and pick up bones and date them. But we're going to talk about mostly a new field that arose is molecular anthropology. And it is a, a arose out of the Human Genome Project, which I'll explain briefly uh, to you because I think it's important. We'll talk about DNA polymorphisms. These are the changes in our DNA. How do they occur and how they are used to track human origins and human migrations? Then we'll talk a little bit about the environmental impact, and then we'll do a conclusion. Now, this I put together this table. It kind of gives a real, real brief overview of us, modern humans. Both physical anthropology and molecular anthropology have dated humans' origins back in Africa about 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens. And this represents about 10,000 generations in a brief 20-year generation period. We ran around Africa for 150,000 years, humans, and exited around 50,000 years ago, only 2,500 generations back. Now, it wasn't until 10 to 20,000 years ago that we lived in dwellings and started farming. So uh, folks, back 500 generations ago, we were kind of before that cavemen, cave women running around, and uh, hunter-gatherers, they called it. The first civilizations weren't until 6,000 years ago, and believe it or not, that's only 300 generations back. So we like to think of ourselves very advanced and just very progressive and modern, but it wasn't that far ago we were pretty antique and pretty uh, beastly uh, people probably running around. And by the way, uh, <clears throat> for those of you interested in uh, dates and times, if only 100 generations ago, your ancestors could have been uh, uh, listening to Christ give a sermon. Now, physical anthropologists have long stated that out of Africa came this 50,000 years ago, uh, came uh, the first humans. They were very dark-skinned. This is a, a typical example of what they estimate they would look like. And uh, they ended up all over the world in many places as light-skinned Eurasians. How did this happen? Well, it turns out we now know that all these differences that appear are generated by changes in our genes, in our genome, which is all the genes in our body, and due to the spontaneous genetic drift. And what this says is we now know that as we live, where our body is constantly changing our DNA. You don't have the exact same DNA when you were, now that you had when you were born. It keeps changing. And it changes between you and your sister, brother, your mother, father. We all keep changing. And some of these things are inherited, and we'll talk about that. And this is now being, all this is being revealed by molecular anthropology. Now, the foundation of molecular anthropology has been the Genome Project. And that is a massive operation many of you heard about. About 10 to 15 years ago, it was started, and it went very quickly, and it was only possible by new technology in the lab and by computer storage and programming and analysis. Now, let me explain the Human Genome Project, because many of you probably don't quite understand what happened. And it was amazing. They took all of the chromosomes that we have in each of our cells. There's 46 of them in each of us, 23 from mom and 23 from dad. <clears throat> they unwound this DNA, 
And they found that there are genes spread throughout the DNA thread, as you see here. And these genes are what codes for proteins in our body to make you and me, to make us what we are. Now, what they did is unwind this DNA even further, and they ended up with what you see, two backbones here of sugar, and in the middle are base pairs, they call them. These are chemical compounds, a thymine to adenine and a guanine to cytosine, and they line up along the DNA through all of the DNA. These are called bases. The interesting thing is, every three of these codes for an amino acid, which then allows this piece of DNA to end up making a protein. It's quite fascinating. Well, the Human Genome Project grabbed this DNA out of our bodies and sequenced all of the DNA in each of our uh, chromosomes. It sequenced e these DNAs in order and put them on a computer, and they did this on a bunch of humans. They went through all of the DNA throughout all the chromosomes, through genes, between genes, etc., and ended up having about three billion base pairs cataloged in absolute order. Now, folks, that's 3,000 million base pairs. So they've done this now for many, many humans, and they've done parts on hundreds and hundreds of humans and many animals, as we'll talk about. So it's truly a remarkable feat. By the way, uh, it was about the same information in 200 city phone books. So go up to Minneapolis someplace and buy 200 or get 200 uh, phone books and stack them up and say, there I am. You know, there you are. Now, <clears throat> what was fascinating, and I could give an hour lecture on this, uh, what have we found in our genomes? Many, many exciting things, ancient virus infections, et cetera, et cetera. One of the ma most amazing things to me was the similarities between our genes and DNA and other animals and each other, and that's the foundation of molecular anthropology. But for instance, I put together a little sequence from the myoglobin gene from a whale, a mammal, and a human, and look at the similarities. Only where there's little blocks are is there a little base change called, you might say, a polymorphism difference. And it's truly amazing is this similarity between the animals. Now, if I put together this table, borrowed from another uh, textbook or two, and what it turns out, we have humans compared to all the lot, many other animals in the world. We have the number of genes it takes to uh, make us up, and it's not that many. And we could, that's a topic of another interesting discussion. But down here is what I want to emphasize is the percent of genes that are homologous uh, with humans. Now, all humans on the earth are 99.9 tenths percent the same. I don't care if we're talking Eskimo, Aborigine, whoever, we're that close. In fact, I will say to you functionally, what's really important, what really makes a difference, we're 99.99 percent the same. Because many of these differences that are cataloged here in this one tenth percent don't matter. So we are uh, uh, one, one base pair out of 3,000 difference between you and the person sitting next to you. But look at the monkeys, 98% homolog homologous at similarities in genes. Mouse, dogs, cats, rats, 90%. Now here's a plant, 50%, a worm, a fly, and you say, Tom, this is bizarre. How could we have genes so similar to such weird animals and organisms? <clears throat> the reason is, that many of these genes, in fact, all that we're talking about, are genes that are needed for the basic formation of life, carrying on of life. These are things like what makes DNA and protein, and that creates the membranes, etc. And all living things use the same mechanisms. The biochemistry is the same in all living things. And I find great comfort in that. You look at animals and you know we're, got, we're tied and linked together by our genomes. Everything you look at is very similar to you. And if you call someone a dirty rat like they used to in the old movies, you know, you're not far wrong because you're 90% right. <laughs> and uh, by the way, my wife doesn't buy any of this because she ha hates rats and mice, and I tell her she's 90% rat, she won't buy it. I mean, there's, so I'm telling you something my wife doesn't go along with here at all. Well, what about us, we humans? <clears throat> it's, uh, as I said, we're one tenth percent sequence difference, but it's really 0.01%. That's how close we are. The next animal has 200 times more changes difference a monkey than we, than we have among each other. So how does this occur? It occurs by polymorphisms. And polymorphisms occur in each of our genomes, as I said at the beginning, on a sort of a spontaneous, but a very uh, preset time and date uh, period. It just occurs at a very constant rate in our genome. 
So you can actually start comparing dates when you go back, comparing people's changes in the DNA. The bulk of these uh, polymorphisms are called SNPs, which are just one change in the base pair. They call them single nucleotide polymorphisms, but that's not what you want to hear this morning. Now, others are insertions and deletions. They're bigger segments. And still others are uh, copy number repeats, where you have the same sequence repeated again and again. A lot of these things are very, very important because they cause a lot of diseases in our bodies. So we individually can generate a predisposition for a disease simply by acquiring one of these in our genome in a very critical gene. Okay, so it gets to be very important for us, and this is med medical genomics, the frontiers of medicine. Well, how do we use this to track our ancestry? <clears throat> you take a human cell, and here's a nucleus with all of our 46 chromosomes, okay? And if we take out one of those chromosomes called the Y chromosome, that's a male chromosome. So males have 40, uh, 23 chromosomes, and one of these is a sex chromosome from dad, that's the Y. The mother donates an X, so all women have XX, all men have an X and a Y of the sex chromosomes. So it makes a male and female. So ultimately, men determine the sex of the, of the child. You take this Y chromosome, it's ideal because it doesn't lose its DNA, it's very stable, and it's only inherited by males, obviously, Y chromosome. So if you strip down this DNA and you look for a change in polymorphism here, you can then study the male, what happens in only the male lineage looking back in time. And we'll go get to that in a minute. Now what's interesting is there's another organelle out in our cytoplasm called mitochondria. And I'm sure most of you heard of that. Practically all living things that are besides bacteria have mitochondria. These were once, based on science analysis, the biochemistry, and everything molecular biology shows or indicates, the mitochondria at one time were bacteria that joined forces with our cells in a symbiotic relationship two and a half billion years ago to create what we call eukaryote cells, cells with organelles and nucleus, things that make up you and animals and plants, et cetera, everything but bacteria. These mitochondria have DNA, and sure enough, if you look at the DNA, you can start looking for polymorphism changes. The neat thing about that is only the women donate the mitochondria uh, to, the, to the child. And only the women carry it on the lineage. So a mother can give it to the daughter and sons, but the son can't pass it on, the daughter only passes it on. So we track female ancestry. By the mitochondrial DNA, we track the male uh, ancestry by the Y. Now, put together this little model because it'll help you understand, what, in a very simple form, what scientists do, the anthropologists tracking our ancestry. Let's say 50,000 years ago, we had a population with this sequence. <clears throat> now, we, uh, these, a group of these people migrated over to another location. Thousands of years later, they're there, and all of a sudden, a polymorphism pops up. Now, part of the, after a long time, another group migrates to another area around the world, okay, and into another area. After they're there a while, they start, they generate finally among the population still another pattern of polymorphisms, same as down here. Then this group subsequently migrates on, and they generate still a third or fourth type pattern of polymorphisms. Now, when the computer and the scientists look at these patterns, they can easily track this one back to here, and these two back to here, and this one to here, and finally to the origin, what they call founder population. The fact that these polymorphisms occur at set times, at set rates, they can calculate a rough date as well. Not only where did this population come from, but where did the one before that come from, and where did the one before that, and how long ago. It's fascinating. And there's about 10 to 12 books out in Barnes and Noble and other places talking about all this. <clears throat> and it gets really interesting. 